Rick is an experienced purchaser for the pawn shop, but he normally deals with more exciting items and collectibles that can get him a few hundreds of dollars of profit each. In this video, we will visit the most extraordinary instances of Rick spending millions of dollars on near legendary items and documents that could gain thousands of visitors in museums. Buckle in as Rick hops across the country in search of these valuable pieces, which at the end will rack up a bill of millions of dollars. Declaration of Independence broadside. We start with Rick in New York City, walking the streets of this hub of culture and life, headed to see one of the most significant cultural and historical documents still remaining from the early founding days of the United States. An original document of independence broadside, of which Rick speculates only 20 remain in private ownership. He seems excited and delighted by the opportunity to see such a marvelous piece of history with his own eyes, to think of seeing and holding a document that had shaped so much of world history and the society we all live in today, must feel surreal. The document has survived centuries and been passed down and preserved as a relic of a time where one of the mightiest empires in the world had yet to even exist. A dark-haired man in glasses named Jeremy opens the door to a red-bricked building in what looks to be a nice section of New York. They make their way into what appears to be Jeremy's home, and they both take a moment to stand over the Declaration of Independence broadside and exclaimed breathlessly over it. Rick calls this a wow moment, and Jeremy laughs and agrees. Then Jeremy begins to explain what exactly he has in his possession. The broadside is sitting on a coffee table, and Jeremy gestures toward it as he begins his sales pitch. He begins, this is an extremely rare July 4th, 1776 printing of the Declaration of Independence. Before he can continue, Rick stops him again to interject excitedly. This is absolutely amazing. This is probably one of the coolest things I have seen in my career. Jeremy explains that he has been in this market for years and that it still thrills him to handle something like this. He explains that the condition of this copy is truly exceptional and that it was sourced from a private collection as it has never been sold publicly. This gives it an extra bit of prestige, as the item has been protected from something as crass as a public auction. No, this item has been sold only to those that could be trusted to care for it properly. This being, despite the item, being so sought after. Rick agrees with the assessment of it being incredible. After all, it was produced right after that historic 4th of July. Because of how important a document this is, Rick is ready with more information and factoids to add to the origin story of this broadside. Rick names John Dunlop as the printer in Philadelphia who was responsible for taking a copy of the Declaration of Independence from Congress, writing it all out on his machine, going back to his print shop and laying out all his materials to begin printing this world-changing document. It is speculated that he printed around 200 copies in his original first printing. Of course, other printers would then take it upon themselves to reprint John Dunlop's first printing across the country to spread word of the political movements being made by some of the most influential and powerful men in the colonies. Rick identifies this particular copy as a New Hampshire printing. Rick goes on to explain how the chain of news and information worked in the age before the internet. He laughingly explains that these reproductions and reprintings were their version of the internet, as they would receive news maybe weeks after the events had occurred. But eventually, everyone would become informed, those who supported the creation of the United States and those who remained loyal to the monarchy overseas. Rick reflects on what a wild time it must have been for the average person just sitting around in a pub talking about what a massive wave would be coming toward them as their ruling powers rebelled against the most powerful country in the world. As Rick finishes his reflection about the famous founding of the country, Jeremy points out the pinholes in the Declaration of Independence broadside, which indicates that this particular copy was displayed publicly. This new detail has Rick spinning another story of what the broadside had experienced, as it hung for possibly a week, as hundreds of people gathered around it to read the latest shift in the political and social landscape. Rick is even more amazed when he realized that these broadsides were never meant to be saved. It is a version of pubs and eateries posting up new regulations or signs that are eventually replaced with something new and discarded. When it gets time to negotiate a price, Jeremy starts off by saying that this document was displayed at the National Constitution Center in Philadelphia, in essence, giving the resume of the artifact. 
The excellent condition and the rarity of it has him pricing the document at $2 million. Rick says he would like to have an expert evaluate it before making any promises as a little bit of knowledge can get you in trouble, he jokes, implying that he is no expert when it comes to artifacts of this magnitude. Rick explains that everything about this broadside seems correct to him. This is not meant to throw any shade or show distrust toward the seller, Jeremy, or even to argue that the document is not worth the two million asking price. It is simply to verify that it is all that it is being presented to be. Seth Collar enters the scene, an expert dealer of historic artifacts and a museum collection builder. He is a documents and artifacts expert on American historical items. He also just so happens to be the expert authenticator of this particular document. We learn this when he says that, in his process of authenticating historical documents, he takes them out of their frames. These kinds of precious and old papers are typically kept in custom frames to protect them from damage. However, he says he does not need to take it out of the frame as he has seen this exact copy before. Rick glances at him inquisitively and proceeds in his explanations. Collar goes into great detail of what convinced him of this broadside's history and bona fides. He says that when he first looked at it, he compared it to every known copy of the same Declaration of Independence broadside. Part of what held it up was the nail holes from back then, which are not as consistent as the nails we have today. In the olden days, they had to smith every individual nail by hand, and so each one made a slightly different hole. He also points out the letters on the broadside, how each one is pressed at a slightly different pressure on the handmade paper, just as it would have been hundreds of years ago. Caller goes on to explain that while people think about the official Declaration of Independence as the one where everyone signed it personally, that actually that particular document was only done a month after the big day, July 4th. He calls that particular document a souvenir of the day, while these broadsides would likely predate it. These printed documents were the ones who held the power over the rebelling country, and there were a couple hundred printed on the night of July 4th to the 5th of 1776, and sent out by John Hancock to major cities where they would then be reprinted. The copy Rick is looking to buy was posted on a wall, so Kaler says, you can imagine someone walking up to it and reading about this event that changed their lives. Rick listened to this entire explanation from Kaler, and he just shakes his head as if to come out of the reverie and asks, so this is legit? To which Kaler responds with a gracious, absolutely, it is 100% legit. He then asks Kaler for the brass tax, also known as what is it worth? Kaler seems to relish in saying the price. He says that this particular copy is very beautiful. It is an important relic, a wonderful broadside. The world changed when the first people laid eyes and read the message. Kaler says he believes it could be worth $2 million at auction. As Kaler leaves, he says that it is a fantastic, rare, earth-changing document. And if Rick can purchase this broadside, he thinks it would be a good investment and that he would be quite jealous. Rick sits beside Jeremy and recaps what the expert said to him. Rick acknowledges that while it may be worth $2 million and that the price tag would be quite the impressive headline in the news, the reality is that those headlines do not account for all of the extra costs surrounding the sale of an item of this kind of historic value. Rick seems to be speaking from a well of great experience as he says that there are a ridiculous amount of fees associated with this and for that reason he would offer $1.4 million. Jeremy seems to hunch in on himself when he hears this number. It is unclear why he has this physical reaction. It could be out of pain or discomfort, or if one is thinking positively, perhaps out of a need to contain his excitement. He lets out a big sigh and stares hard at the broadside, thinking over the deal, before he says that Rick makes a fair point about the fees. Jeremy shrugs and lifts his hands a little when he says that he knows how it works, and he would be willing to sell it for $1.5 million. Rick processes that and says he would meet him in the middle and give him $1.45 million because he thinks that it is a fair price and both would be happy with that deal. When Jeremy accepts, Rick nearly explodes with excitement. He is flowing as he looks down at the broadside. He exclaims with an, oh my goodness, I own the Declaration of Independence. Jeremy congratulates him and Rick assures him that he will wire the money to him and will be by tomorrow to pick up the piece because he has a friend he wants to show it to. As they give each other some parting pleasantries, Jeremy is given an exit interview. Jeremy's expression is rather calm as he explains his thinking process around selling the declaration for $1.45 million when the appraiser said it could get around $2 million. 
Jeremy says that this deal means there will be no fees for the auctioneers. Get the deal done today. So he is happy, and he says they should do the fireworks. A funny reference to the 4th of July and a celebration. Rick is an experienced pawn shop buyer who usually deals with more appealing things and collectibles that may net him hundreds of dollars. Let's see Rick's most epic expenditure of millions of dollars on near-legendary things and papers that may draw thousands of museum visitors. Stay in as Rick travels the nation in pursuit of these priceless antiques, which will cost millions. Banksy Art Rick, strolling confidently in front of Buckingham Palace, declaring his mission to snag some Banksy art in the heart of London. Cut to an intriguing scene, a vibrant wall adorned with a fusion of graffiti, featuring a captivating depiction of two police officers grappling with the challenge of apprehending or ticketing a humanoid creature ablaze with fiery colors. Rick gives us some important details about Banksy, saying that he is one of the most famous graffiti artists in the world hands down. He is quite effusive in his hand gestures as he says that Banksy recently had an original piece sell for $12 million. Rick is walking up to a red brick townhouse as he says that an art collector that is in possession of some Banksy originals is in the mind to sell, and Rick says he is in the mind to buy. As he finishes the sentence, we can see how the graffiti art made by Banksy is on an ordinary wall in London but it is protected by a pane of bulletproof glass, likely to preserve it for curious citizens that find the time to appreciate some art as they walk along. Rick says he hopes that the price is not crazy because he thinks it would be an incredible investment to purchase an original right now, and he did not fly around the world just to go home empty-handed. As the door to the red brick townhouse opens, we see a gentleman in a suit and crisp white shirt wordlessly welcome Rick inside, as we pan out to see them walking through the house, one can easily spot the tall ceilings, the luxurious furnishings, and a bookshelf with all manner of books, pictures, miscellaneous paperweights that all give the surroundings a warm feel. As they enter the home library, the unnamed art collector turns to Rick and says, that's the piece. Rick freezes and lets out a woe. On the wall of the family's cozy library is a framed original Banksy, of a monkey using a detonator like a pogo stick. Rick is amazed, and he walks forward, his jaw dropped, and immediately identifies the piece as Monkey Detonator. The art collector says yes, it was made in 2002. It is an original piece made out of a stencil and sprayed on the board. Rick puts his hands behind his back as he once again reiterates how amazing the piece is, then quickly unfolds his arms from behind his back and points down to the pool table beside the two men, and he asks, is that one his too? The room they are standing in is then revealed to not just be a library, but more of a den or recreational room, as the pool table is standing beside a large cello. The piece on the pool table is also framed but is much smaller than the monkey detonator. It is a picture of a rat wearing a peace sign necklace, and it is leaning on a sign that says, welcome to hell in scarlet letters. The art collector explains that this piece is an original screen print. Rick is amazed at the pieces the collector has just casually hung in his family's den. His eyes constantly stray to Detonator Monkey, and he observes that the monkey looks angry and laughs at his own observation, turning to the art collector who laughs with him. This is where we learn that the collector is actually a representative for the true owner of the two pieces. We learn this when he says he is representing the sale of the two pieces, Detonator Monkey and Welcome to Hell, and that the owner is looking to get 918 US dollars for both the pieces. Rick repeats that this is incredible as he loves Banksy. He elaborates by saying that Banksy came up with his own particular style, so that when you see a Banksy you say, that's Banksy. This observation is quite incisive as the most famous and remarkable of artists are known for their signature styles, something that is not easily cultivated or earned. In this aspect, Banksy is perhaps the most recognizable modern artist. Rick adds that Banksy's appeal also comes from the crazy mystique he has about him, because no one knows who he or she even is. Rick also notes that it is literally the most popular art in the world now. He says this is the hottest art, there will be a day when a Banksy original breaks the $100 million market, and he truly believes that. The art representative listens to this with wide eyes, 
raised eyebrows, and lips pressed together. It is difficult to say whether or not he agrees with Rick's predictions for the Banksy art market, but he vocally agrees with Rick. Rick looks a bit emotional as he gazes at the detonator monkey. His Baker Boy hat seems to cast a shadow over his eyes, lending an even more solemn cast to his overall emotional appearance. Rick's hand is placed on the wall beside the art piece, seeming to brace himself against it, his gray flannel making his cheeks look flushed. We learn why as he describes what he knows about the piece. He says Banksy made this piece in 2002, right after the entire economy melted down across the planet, right after the events of 9-11. And Rick says he just looks at it as any random thing can just blow up everything. A very personal and deep view into Rick's personal thoughts and reflections on life are revealed as he takes in the art. Rick ends his insight with a laugh, and the representative just responds with, Unfortunately, you never know who is going to press on the red button nowadays. His French accent becoming more prevalent as he says this. Rick agrees, and he is shaking his head, thinking, and trying to put into words that the Banksy is simple, but it's just quintessential Banksy. The representative moves over to the pool table, and he gestures down to the white-framed Welcome to Hell piece, and he says this one is edition 175 and comes with a certificate of authenticity made by the pest control. Rick replies, the pest control is like his, Banksy's, authentication company, or something like that. To which the representative says yes, it also came with a bill that was cut in half with a number, and the pest control will keep the other half to make sure it's original. We are informed by an informational tag that Banksy formed his own authentication company, Pest Control, to avoid the traditional gallery system. This is likely to preserve his own anonymity as much as possible and to keep track of their pieces themselves. Rick takes in this information and he concludes that if you go to resell one of these, they will say yes, we can authenticate the piece to which he gets a yes. Rick then between both pieces, and he says you have the certification for the Welcome to Hell piece, but do you have the certification for the Detonator Monkey? The Frenchman replies that yes, he does, as the owner conserved the original. Rick looks thoughtful, and his hands seem to twist in the air as he thinks about what he wants to say next. Finally, he seems to shrug and just asks bluntly, how much? The French representative says his client is asking for 750,000 pounds. Rick is unsure of the exchange rate, but he guesses that would be around $900,000. To that, the salesman shrugs and says it would be around that amount, Rick gestures down to the pool table, asking, and the rat? With his hands gesturing downward. The client has asked for 15,000 pounds for the screen print of Welcome to Hell. Rick again tries to do the exchange rate, and he says, so, 18,000 American? Again, the representative says more or less, and moves his shoulders up and down a little. Rick says that since he knew he was coming here, he had arranged for a local expert that was recommended to him to come see the pieces. He explains that the expert specializes in street art and Banksy, and he wanted him to come down and authenticate the pieces. Rick takes a few steps away, and he looks into the camera as he says that $900,000 is detonating his brain. We then cut to a quick transition, and a man in a crisp blue shirt has arrived, and Rick introduces his expert to the Banksy on the wall. The expert says, wow, let me take a closer look as he moves in closer. His hands are clasped at his waist, linked together, his head bent forward, and he seems to move with his head pointed in the direction of the painting with great interest. He immediately knows that this is the monkey detonator and that the piece is easily identifiable as a Banksy just from the overspray. When he says this, he gestures over the framed piece. The camera slowly moves up the body of the monkey to show it in greater detail. The edges of the monkey are quite fuzzy. It is not a perfect stencil job. This, the expert says, is how one can identify a Banksy by the slight blurred lines. Rick agrees and says, yeah, it screams Banksy. Rick asks what the expert thinks about it, and he answers Rick by saying that it is an important work by him, and obviously an early work by him. But the expert says, Banksy was painting way back in the late 90s on the street quite early in Bristol and organizing events, and then he came up to London, and that is really when 2000-2001 is when his notoriety started to rise. When he finishes that rather long dialogue, Rick gestures to the Welcome to Hell print on the pool table. What do you think of this one? He asks. 
The expert takes his hands out of his pockets when he says that Banksy's rats are his signature, but he thinks this is one of the special ones for him. The French art representative cuts in with a yeah during this conversation between Rick and the expert. The expert says he believes this piece is quintessential Banksy. In an informational tag included in the episode, it lets the audience know that Welcome to Hell is part of a trilogy that includes other pieces, Get Out While You Can, and Because I'm Worthless. It is not difficult to sense a theme with these titles. Rick says he just wants to make sure he is buying legitimate pieces and that he is buying them at the right price. Rick finally asks, so are they both legit? This gives the expert the cue to go ahead and reach for the certificates of authenticity. In the shot, the expert can be seen excitedly reaching forward, while the art representative stands to the side looking a bit nervous. But he sounds steady and patient when he responds to the expert, saying yes, these are the certificates. The expert says that they are very lucky the artist came up with this system so that they can check with pest control themselves and know the real McCoy. The expert is holding the certificate, almost as if he has rubbed his fingers against the paper. The expert is covering his mouth, standing to the right of him. The Banksy expert says that with certain security features on the paper itself, he can tell that this is a legitimate Banksy. The camera then pans to welcome to hell. When the French representative is asked for the certificate for the detonator monkey, he tells them that the owner is currently on a business trip and they can send them the certificate. The expert says okay and turns to Rick and he says that the process of him checking would take 24 hours. Rick says so. If I make a deal, you can get them all checked out and we can just broker the entire thing through your shop. The expert says it would be a pleasure to do that. Rick again asks, what are they worth? The anticipation rises and the expert turns to the wall and says that the detonator monkey on a good day in auction would achieve 900,000 pounds, maybe more. Rick clarifies pounds and quickly calculates that this would be a smidge more money than a million dollars. Then he gestures to welcome to hell and asks what this would go for. The expert replies that recent auction results have seen this particular print achieve 16,000 pounds. Rick sways back and forth a bit and says, so that is around $19,000. The representative and the expert both nod along. Rick sighs and says, all right, I will give you a call if the deal comes together and we will get it done. He and the expert shake hands. The representative and the expert politely say their goodbyes, shakes hands, and the Banksy expert leaves the room. His portion of the sale is completed. The only two left are Rick and the representative for the owners of the Banksy original art piece. Rick is thinking hard when he sighs deeply and says, okay, I will give you 500,000 pounds total. That is $600,000 in American currency. The representative also sighs and shakes his head. He says that, I am afraid, but for this price, we are a bit far, especially since the market is pretty high right now. Rick has a more airy tone when he says, all right, I will tell you what, I will give you 600,000 pounds. That is $720,000. He ends this with his hands open wide, in a gesture similar to a welcoming movement. The representative says that this is a very generous offer, but that is too far still from what his clients want. Rick then comes back with, do you think your client will take 650? That is 780,000 American dollars. The representative looks stressed under the lights of the camera. He sighs and tilts his head to the left a bit and has his lips pressed together. And he says he will try to reach the client and let them hear this offer for themselves and get back to him right away. As he leaves the room, he asks Rick to give him a moment, and he pulls out his cell phone. Rick is left standing, looking down at the Welcome to Hell screen print longingly. He narrates that he really wants these things. Call me crazy, he says, but he did not cross the pond for nothing. When the representative returns, he says, good news, you have the deal. If you agree to 700,000 pounds, that would be $840,000. Rick aborts the handshake, and he looks at him through narrowed eyes, hands up in a questioning gesture, saying he offered 650,000 pounds. The representative says that his client is a very tough businessman, and to believe him when he says that the market will continue to grow, and this is a great deal he has on his hands. The negotiator for the Banksy owners has his hand out ready for a deal, while Rick continues to gaze at the detonator monkey as he sways back and forth, sighing in thought. You won't regret it, says the representative. And Rick says, my family will think I'm nuts, but you have a deal, and shakes his hand. Rick says, okay, 
as he starts doing the conversions in his head, and he tells him to get everything over to Oliver, the Banksy expert, and that the second he tells him everything is verified, he will wire the money and get them paid. The representative says, congratulations, you won't regret it because Banksy is bankable, he says laughingly. Rick gives a laugh mixed with a huff of air at the corny joke. Rick turns to the camera and says that hopefully, Corey and Chum don't have him committed when he gets back to Vegas. New England shilling. Rick is in Boston. We see him in a gray shirt, a nice watch on his wrist, as he explains that he is in the city because he found a person who has a 1652 New England shilling, which he says is literally the first coin ever minted in the colonies. Rick says that if he can pick this thing up, he can make his own serious coinage. He gives a rather diabolical-looking grin at this corny joke, rubbing his hands together and giggling as he heads inside a big, beautifully appointed building. As Rick enters a glass conference room holding a long table with dozens of chairs around it, he shakes hands with a little old man in spectacles, and he exclaims, You must be Ed. Great to meet you. Then he gestures to the table, jumping right into the item of interest. And that is it, of colonial coins. This is the holy grail, he says. Rick is sitting at the table looking at Ed who is seated at the head of the table as he explains how these coins were the first coins struck in the colonies. We get a nice shot of the silver coin, held in what looks like a plastic case whose teeth hold the coin in place to avoid it falling out and being lost. It has strangely thin and jagged edges, along with a very tarnished gray cast over it, although the insignia on the header of the coin is of a fancy N which is still visible. Rick says that they were very proud of the coins, even though it is possibly the plainest coin ever made. He looks up at Ed with a wry expression on his face. A tag on the screen shows that in 1652, the Massachusetts General Court put into law for coins to be minted on U.S. soil. Ed repeats the information Rick has already said, telling Rick that he has in his possession a 1652 New England silver shilling. And he found the coin 30 years ago in the Boston area, and he recently learned that it is a very valuable and rare coin. His desire is to share this with someone who shares his interest in the coin. Rick says this coin is very cool because in the 1650s, the colonies still considered themselves British subjects, but they just wanted a little more autonomy, and this coin was sort of like saying they were not completely independent from England, but kind of independent from England. A pop-up tag informs the audience that before 1952, coin minting for England-owned territories was authorized by the British Treasury. The coin was another step toward angering the English. Rick laughs. Rick is holding the coin in his hand, which we can now see is in its own little coin case, with labeling at the top confirming that it is a New England shilling. He says he is amazed that the coin had not been clipped, because you never see old coins complete like this. People would try to clip a bit off the edges every time they would get a hold of a coin, trying to save some extra silver for themselves, eventually having enough to make up a second shilling. Rick says that the problem with that scheme is that eventually they would have next to no coin left, which is why Sir Isaac Newton invented the reeded edges. In a pop-up tag, we are informed that as of 2019, there are only 20 of these 1652 New England shillings on record. Ed nods along to all of Rick's tangents and agrees that his shilling is in awfully good shape. Rick is examining both sides of the coin and reading off that it is from New England. When he flips it over, he reads the Twetartin on the back, which Ed says stands for 12 pence. A pence is the plural form of penny. We are informed by yet another pop-up tag of information. Rick marvels at the great shape the coin is in, and he says that in the coin-collecting world, it is one of the big finds. Rick asks how much Ed wants for the shilling. Ed says he has seen it at auction from anywhere from $200,000 and upwards of $400,000. He is nodding as he says this and adds that he thinks that would be a good starting point. Rick laughs and says, well, that is not a real starting point. So Ed laughs and says, well, how about $300,000? Rick hums and hems and says, what about $225,000? To which Ed says he is not sure he wants to go that low. How about $250,000? Rick looks at the coin and says that it is in great shape, and at $250,000, he thinks he can still manage to make some money from the rare silver New England shilling, so they got a deal. They shake hands, in one of the quickest deals Rick has ever had. Ed says he was very happy to make the sale today, 
and that with the money his wife has been pestering him to get out of the cold New England winters, so maybe he will buy a second home in a warmer climate. Rick, the seasoned pawn shop buyer with a knack for turning the ordinary into extraordinary, typically dealing with appealing collectibles that rake in hundreds, let's take a look Rick's world of high-stakes acquisitions. From hidden gems to historical treasures, this video unveils the extraordinary lengths Rick goes to in order to secure these artifacts that could reshape the narrative of our shared history, which are worth millions. Silver Collection, 3000 O's. A young-looking man in a dark sweater and silver striped tie is wheeling a heavy-looking cart behind him when Rick asks, what have we got here? A whole lot of silver, the man replies. Rick laughs and says, let me help you out real quick, noticing how the young man struggles to even pull the cart a few inches closer to the counter where Rick is working. Rick's narration informs us that the old man, in this case his father, is crazy about silver. He anticipates his father behaving like a kid on Christmas morning when he sees all this silver. Rick says he has never seen his father get up from his desk so quickly, to which his father tells him he always gets up from his desk and shoes Rick's hands off of the bars of silver on the counter. In a pop-up box of information, we learn that humans learned to separate silver from lead as early as 3000 BC, and that today, Peru and Mexico are the world's largest producers of silver. The young silver collector, now identified as Jeff, explains he has come to the pawn shop to sell his silver. He has over 3,000 ounces, because growing up, his father taught him to invest, and so he is here today to cash in on his investment. Jeff says that if they want less than face value, he is willing to see what they can work out. Rick is amazed at the boatload of silver Jeff has wheeled into the shop. He asks where he got it all from. Jeff replies that he bought the silver 12 years ago, held on to it, and now he is here today. Rick asks him to sort and explain what specifically each sack contains, as he has multiple methods of transporting all the silver. Jeff first places his hand on a cloth sack containing a ton of coins. He says that the bag contains 90% silver dimes. He touches the bottom of the bag and says that portion is silver quarters. In front of the counter are bars of gold, the biggest of which he says is silver, and it weighs around 75 pounds. A pop-up informational box informs the audience that without silver, our cars could not run, as every electrical action in modern cars is conducted by silver. Rick says that most people do not realize that until 1964, all U.S. dimes, quarters, and half dollars and silver dollars were all made out of silver, and that paper money has always been a promise to pay you with real money, i.e. gold and silver. Rick's father, Richard, chimes in, and he informs Jeff that he has been collecting silver for 30 years, as silver and gold is a hedge against hyperinflation. A pop-up box says that in the earliest Egyptian records, silver was considered more precious than gold. Rick says that silver has been mined since as far back as 3000 BC, and that silver mining really blew up after the discovery of the New World, when they found huge amounts of it in South America. Rick gets his hands into the sack of coins and says he just needs to verify that it is all silver coinage. Rick takes out a handful and says that it is really important for him to scan all the edges on the coins to make sure there are no modern coins in the batch. Rick says that when you look at the edge of a quarter or a dime today, all you see is copper and nickel. But pre-1964 coins are all silver, no copper. Rick takes a deeper look into the sack and says that they all look right and they all have the right color. So he asks if it is all right, if he weighs the bags just to make sure they weigh the right amount. Jeff has no issues with that. And when Rick returns, he writes down that Jeff brought in 3,072 ounces of silver. Rick notes that Jeff bought the silver right at the bottom of the silver marker because in the late 1990s, silver was down to $3 an ounce. But silver is the best conductor of electricity there is, and it is used in cell phones, computers, televisions. Last year, half a billion ounces of silver was used in industry, and a shortage of silver has begun to appear. A pop-up tag notifies us that silver is used in NASA space shuttles and rear window defoggers. I would love to buy silver, all day, every day of the week, says Rick. He says silver is good to invest in because there is a set profit margin, and he can sell it immediately. Rick then turns to the huge bar of silver in the center on the counter and asks, so what do you want to do with it? Jeff eagerly responds with an, I want to sell it. Richard is more sedate 
when he reaches forward and places his hand on the largest bar of silver that Jeff has brought in and informs him that the bar will be very difficult to sell. And he turns to his son and says, and you know why? Jeff looks confused, as in his mind, the largest bar of silver held pride of place in his collection. Rick explains the situation to Jeff and tells him that when people are dealing with this much money in silver, there is a great temptation to put a bar of steel or something at the center of the bar of silver. He also notes that when they make silver bars, they do not usually make them at such odd weight, and gestures to the marker proclaiming the bar of silver to weigh 29, 11, Kiraiji. Jeff is aghast and he asks Rick if he thinks his bar may not be pure silver. Rick explains that what he is trying to say is that there may be a chunk inside the bar that is not pure silver. Jeff asks anxiously if there is a way to test the bar. Rick tells him he can drill some holes in it and test the shavings to make sure whether they are silver and if everything checks out, he will be willing to buy it from him and pay him. And if it does not check out, he will give Jeff an address of where he can send the bar of silver. Jeff is shown on camera as he explains that he had never even considered that this bar may not be silver, and so because of that, he is very nervous. We then cut to Rick in his workroom drilling a hole into the bar of silver and collecting the shavings. He explains that testing silver is not rocket science, it just takes a little work. The process is simply to drill a hole deep enough to make sure there is not a lead core or some other metal in the middle of the bar. Then, you melt down all of the filings until they liquefy and you create a small button. Then the last step is dropping some nitric acid on it and seeing what color it turns. When nitric acid reacts with pure silver, it turns a creamy white. If it is any other metal, it can turn from green to blue to gray. Rick returns with the bar of unidentified metal and sets it on the counter. He takes a real dramatic pause as he turns to face Jeff and readies to give him the news. Here's the deal, he says to Jeff. Yeah, it's all right. It's fine. Rick says that now that he knows it is pure silver, he would be happy to buy the humongous bar presented to him, but he must factor in the unusual cost when trying to sell something so heavy and odd-shaped. Rick does some quick calculations on his calculator and notepad, and he tells Jeff that his total value of silver is around $110,901. Jeff says, well, let's make a deal, to which Rick stares at him and says, that is the deal. Jeff tries to get him to go to 115000 but Rick says, there is not much profit here, and Jeff's rebuttal is, can Rick not just hold the silver for a year or so, and then sell the silver for $120,000? To this, Rick replies that while that is a possibility, it is also a possibility that he will end up selling it for $50,000, should the silver market collapse. Jeff acknowledges this truth and chuckles along with Rick. Rick says, he is not a speculator when it comes to silver, he is just a businessman. When Jeff asks for the best offer, Rick says he is only willing to go to $111,000, throwing in an extra $99 to even it out. Richard intervenes and tells Jeff that he is welcome to check around, but most people will not give him such a good deal. Rick agrees with his father and says you are free to tote that silver around and look for a better deal. This sounds like a very unappealing prospect to Jeff. Jeff then decides that he is going to take the deal as he bought 12 years ago for far less than he is selling it for now, and so it sounds like a good deal to him. Jeff says he is very happy that his dad taught him to invest, because today he is walking away with over $100,000. Richard playfully tells his son that he is going to take one of these, and reaches for a silver bar. Rick quickly says, oh no you're not, and tries to snatch back the silver. 1992 Schweizer Helicopter Rick is driving down the Las Vegas streets, as he says that he got a call from a friend who repairs helicopters a few days ago, and that he says he has a guy who wants to sell him one. He sets up a meeting, and Rick walks into a garage holding a helicopter, and then beside it, a strange-looking pile of steel that the owner, Sean, claims is the inside of a helicopter. Rick looks at the hunk of junk in disappointment and skepticism. Sean assures him that it is all there. Sean is a helicopter pilot, and he is trying to sell the 1992 Schweizer helicopter, which was built by the Schweizer Aircraft Corp in 1992, and is one of the safest and most reliable helicopters in the market. Sean says he purchased the helicopter from the insurance company because he wanted to rebuild it as a fun project, but he is having tough times right now, so he is forced to sell it and get his money back out of it. Rick looks at it and tells him that it looks like a pile of junk to him, and he asks if the pilot died when it crashed, 
because he wants to know because that incident might give him a bad vibe about the helicopter. Sean says the pilot and the passenger were fine. A pop-up tag informs the audience that this model is particularly safe because the fuel tanks are designed to break free on impact, thus saving anyone inside from a fiery conflagration. Sean explains to Rick that he initially purchased the helicopter because he thought it would be fun to rebuild it himself. He then continues by saying he lost his job and can no longer afford that hobby. Rick is honest immediately in saying that he just does not think he can do anything with it and that it is in much worse shape than anything Larry told him about, or he assumed. Then enters Larry, an older man in glasses who shakes hands with Rick and Sean. Larry, a pilot and flight school owner, is also the chairman of the board for LJ Air Corporation and is one of the largest fleet owners of Schweizer in the Southwest. Rick says that when he called down here, he had been expecting a helicopter and not whatever this is. Larry laughs and says that this is an opportunity. Rick wants more details, so he asks what kind of helicopter this is. Larry explains that the Schweizer 300T 1992 was initially designed for the military in 1967, and they did all the flight training in the army with it, but it was actually designed to crash and be able to be fixed in the field there instead of taking it back to a factory. Rick then rephrases all of this information as the only helicopter meant to be crashed. Rick says he would be very interested in speaking with the man who designed this helicopter because it has crashed and really does not look that good. Rick says that he does not know much about helicopters, but for him to stay here much longer, Larry is really going to have to do some fast talking. Larry tells him that while the helicopter appears to be in bad condition, frankly the whole front cab can be rebuilt in about two to three weeks. Rick asks if the motor survived the crash to which Larry replies that yes, it did. And this is good because if Rick were to buy the engine, it is a $30,000 engine and he would be able to have that good to start with. Larry continues, gesturing to the engine on the ground, explaining that each other components into the drivetrain like pulleys are $20,000 a piece and they are in good condition. So all of the pieces it would take to rebuild the aircraft are okay. Rick finally asks how much it would cost to rebuild the entire helicopter. Larry looks contemplative and then says a thumb sketch estimate would be around $100,000. Rick's face is the picture of surprise at this high figure. He is honest when he says that he simply does not see where there is any money to be made from this venture. Larry then chimes in and says that the retail value of the helicopter is around $150,000. So there would be a $50,000 gain immediately just by rebuilding the helicopter. Rick pauses, and in his confessional he says that Larry is throwing around some huge numbers that's scary, but if that translates into huge profits, he is very interested. Sean says he bought it from the insurance company for $10,000, so that is what he is looking to get out of it. Sean's tone has remained the same since we are first introduced to him, very calm and almost apathetic to the goings-on around him. Rick lets out a breath of air as he gazes at the skeleton of the downed helicopter. Rick asks if he is taking less than 10, to which Sean responds that he cannot afford to take less than $10,000. The camera pans over all of the tools and random pieces of equipment that have been sorted into plastic containers all around the frame of the helicopter. It all looks a bit grim and sad. It is likely for this reason that Rick decides to be generous and agrees to the $10,000 deal. Normally, Rick would try to push for a much lower price so it is unusual for him to agree to a deal with no argument. The audience can likely make their own inferences as to why Larry invited Rick down to purchase the frame of a helicopter from a young helicopter enthusiast pilot who has recently lost his job and his ability to make something of the helicopter. Rick says he feels good about buying this because like Larry said, even if he does not fix it up, he can always sell it for parts and he can make like five grand off of them. He tells Larry that before he starts working on it, to let him run this by his pops real quick because he just doesn't want him weirding out on him. Larry laughs and shrugs and says that it makes sense as he would do the same. In the next clip, Rick, Chum, Corey, and his dad are at the flight school on a windy day and Rick tells him, see I told you it was nice. When the camera zooms out we see what he was talking about, a black shining helicopter that in no way resembles the frame he had been sold for $10,000. Rick compliments Larry and says that it looks amazing and like a real helicopter. 
as one month ago, that thing looked like a scrap heap and that Larry did an amazing job. Larry says that basically everything on it had to be rebuilt. The frame was okay and the engine was okay. So basically all he had to do was rebuild the body and he searched around and found a lot of reconditioned parts so that he did not need to put all brand new parts on the craft. However, he makes sure that everything on the helicopter that must be reliable was purchased brand new. He says that after he got the cab together and out in all the glass, he knew that it was all going to be a good aircraft and that once they lifted the engine in, the aircraft was done. He says that all it took was time and knowing how to do it. Rick then says, so the big question is whether we got it fixed for 100 grand. Larry licks his lips and says that, well, since they used so many original parts, reconditioned parts, he saved Rick a lot of money and he believes he kept it to the 100,000 mark he was looking for. Larry estimates that Rick will be able to sell for around $160,000 to $175,000. Rick is extraordinarily delighted that the repairs did not go over budget and that it turned out so beautiful. Rick says that he will be even happier if they can sell the helicopter at a profit because they have so much money tied up in it. Then Rick volunteers his father to take the maiden voyage on the newly rebuilt helicopter. Corey jokes that they all had the most to gain with their grandpa going down with the helicopter, and Richard says that the joke is on Corey as he left everything to the cat in his will. Richard jokes that he likes flying, but especially when it takes him away from Rick and Corey. In the final scene, we see Larry and Richard take off in the helicopter. Rick, a seasoned pawn shop expert, embarks on an extraordinary journey into the world of million-dollar acquisitions. He aims to secure rare items and historical documents that could become museum centerpieces. We document Rick's journey from hidden corners to prestigious auctions, showcasing passion, risk, and the pursuit of extraordinary pieces that redefine the meaning of value. 1967 Shelby GT350, the Eleanor Wimbledon white classic car. A shop employee tells Rick that there is a guy in the back with an Eleanor that wishes to speak with him. Rick is confused as he walks down the hall and approaches the exit, leading to the parking lot outside. Before he exits, he makes sure to put on a pair of sunglasses to protect his eyes from the intense heat and light of the Las Vegas sun. Rick immediately laughs and says, you have got to be kidding me. He immediately says, Shelby GT350 gone in 60 seconds the movie, it's Eleanor. I get it. He shakes the car owner's hand, a smaller framed gentleman in sunglasses and a salmon-colored polo shirt. Rick crouches beside the car and inspects it from every angle he can. The camera zooms in on the more noticeable and iconic elements of the car, like the Cobra emblem and the curves and form of the vehicle. This is the real thing, not a clone, says Rick. The owner says that there were around 1175 made in total of this particular model. Then Rick says it reminds him of his tennis racket and is able to identify the color as Wimbledon White, the true mark of a Shelby fan. A pop-up tag informs the audience that in 1965, the first Shelby GT350 was released as a high-performance racing machine. The Eleanor, as it is affectionately known, was used in the film Gone in 60 Seconds and sold at auction for $1 million. However, this model does not have the added prestige of starring in an iconic film. The owner of the vehicle begins telling what he knows about the origin of the car, naming Carol Shelby as a great race car driver, as well as a great builder of cars, and that is why Ford got involved with him to begin with. He says he purchased his car here in Las Vegas 12 years ago and says that it is a treasure to own. He also throws in that what made this car famous was the film Gone in 60 Seconds, starring Nicolas Cage. And in the movie, they nickname the car Eleanor. That is why the car is worth more value today. We find out that the owner of the car is named Paul, thanks to a helpful pop-up under his face. Rick says that it is really an iconic car, and that this is what a muscle car is supposed to look like. And he says that a lot of people like Mustangs, but that as far as his taste is concerned, they did not start making them look good until 1967 and 1968, because that's when they looked cool. Paul says that it was originally a Ford as Al L. Shelby's were. Rick picks up this thread of thought and completes it for him by adding that the thing was that Ford built them and then sent them to the Shelby plant and they did a little bit of motor work and a little body work and that made it a GT350. 
Paul has even more information, saying that it's actually the fourth of the last GT350, because in 68, 69, and 70, all those cars were turned over to Ford, and that's when Shelby's hands were taken off the cars. The 67 was one of the last ones he had his hands on. Rick agrees with this long spiel and says that the 67 is the best period. Paul looks toward the car and says he appreciates that acknowledgement. Rick says that it really, this was the way Carol Shelby envisioned the car, and he worked on it. His guys worked on it. It wasn't guys at the Ford plant who were just slapping things together and did not care. Rick says that the Shelby 1967 GT350 is one of the quintessential cool cars of the 1960s and that it was right around a hundred modifications that Shelby did to a Ford Mustang to make the GT350, and it improved its performance, its handling, and its style. Needless to say, this is a car that is about as cool as it gets, and I would love to have it, says Rick. The camera pans over to the beautiful muscle car shining in the sun, and it goes through the open door to show the black leather interior, the shining steering wheel that is made of a gleaming wood and steel. The dashboard is a dream to behold, every inch of it in perfectly preserved detail, as if it has just rolled out of the car lot. Rick lets out an ah of contentment as he beholds the speedometers and their beautiful detail, shining as if they had been made only a week ago. Rick says that the interior of the car is so clean and really nice it looks quite beautifully stocked, and that's what he likes to see. Paul says, yep, it has the original four-speed top loader, and it has 63,000 original miles on the car. Rick notes that the car has the original gauges. He comments that he is sure that the seats had been redone. To this, Paul adds that only the inserts of the seats have been reupholstered. Rick says that the work to the seats is to be expected, and that it does not matter so long as the work has been done correctly. And as he looks over the work on the seats, he says that it all looks right to him. Now Paul gives him a great detail that he had been sitting on this whole time. Carol Shelby had signed the glove box of the car. Rick has a factoid in his back pocket for this, and he says that he charged a couple hundred bucks for a signature. The buyer just had to donate the money to his charity. Paul nods and says yes, that's the way it went. Rick agrees that the signature is definitely a plus as far as he was concerned. This is a curious comment to make, but perhaps approval of the signature was not given from the start. While in some people's eyes the signature is a bonus feature, to others it could be seen as a blemish on the beautiful interior of the car. Rick says that if he is being completely honest, he is a little shocked. A car like this rarely drives into his shop. It looks legit to his eyes, but he is assuming that Paul will want an arm and a leg for this car. Rick laughs and says that if this was his car, that's the kind of price he would want for it. He asks Paul how much he wants to get out of this deal. Paul says $125,000 as he has done his research on the vehicle and he knows that this is the worth of the car. Rick says that before he makes any deals, he wants to consult with a friend of his first. Rick says that this is a very expensive car and there's a million little things that raise and lower the price on these things. So he just wants his expert friend who knows everything about the car to help them reach a good compromise. Paul is not offended by this and says that if he was in Rick's position, he would also want to call in someone to take a look. He is not concerned as he knows his vehicle is authentic and in excellent condition, so its value will definitely match his asking price. The Shelby expert has dark spiky hair and a boisterous attitude. When he arrives, he immediately exclaims at the beauty of the car and says that they need to take a look under the dress and see what they're working with here. When the hood is popped open, he immediately exclaims, Nice, there it is, the Hypo 289 man, he says. He notes that it looks like it is a very well-kept engine bay and that it is a car that has been cherished. He can tell that much. What really makes the difference is the test drive, he says. They all laugh, but the expert insists that it is the only way to validate when it's a real Shelby. Paul says that he thinks it's the real deal. And Rick asks if he minds if they take it for a spin around the block to make sure there are no problems and that everything is running smoothly. Paul is fine with this idea, and Rick promises not to break anything. The dark-haired Shelby expert and Rick hop into the car, and from the moment the engine roars on, the expert immediately says, That's the Hypo 289, let's do this. Paul calls out for them not to hurt his baby as they race off down the street. 
Rick's friend begins to speak, saying that, back in 1967, if you were driving this car, you were kind of a baller. This was paying a lot of money to drive a Mustang. You could drive a Porsche for the price of a Shelby back then. The further along they drive, the more positive comments are expelled from the passenger seat, saying that the drive is real tight and we finally see a reveal of the Shelby expert's name, Bill. He gives a glowing review of the driving capabilities, saying that it has really good power and that everyone knows that the car would get the goods when you lay on the throttle. When they arrive back in the parking lot with Paul, Rick asks how much he thinks the Shelby would be worth. Bill says his best estimate is from $100,000 to $110,000 would be his best guess for how much it's worth. Bill thanks Paul for letting them take his car for a nice easy meander down the road and shakes hands with everyone, then leaves the negotiation up to the two men. Rick says he thinks it's a great car and he says that he rarely does this, but he does not want to negotiate and says he will give him $100,000 for the car. Rick insists that there's no money past 100 grand, none. By this, of course, he means that there's no money for him to make off of the car past that price point. Paul asks if it is feasible for Rick to go to 105,000, to which Rick replies no, because anything past 100 grand does not make him a dime of sense. Paul thinks it over and decides to take the deal. Rick says sweet and tells him they should go draw up the deal and see whether Rick's dad will yell at him for taking off from work to drive around for a week. Paul gives his exit interview at the end of the episode, and he says that he figured this was a good point for him to let it go. And now Rick has the car, he has the money, and it was time for him to go home. Hard Rock Hotel Photograph Collection Rick is in his truck driving down the Las Vegas roads as B-roll of the beautiful and lively Las Vegas Strip passes by the screen, focusing in on the neon electric guitar that announced the Hard Rock Hotel's location for all to see. Rick is monologuing and saying that the Hard Rock Hotel that was once right off the strip has closed down, and the entire property was covered with amazing rock and roll memorabilia and photography. He then looks quite passionate in his blue checkered shirt that really highlights the bloodshot quality of his eyes and says that all of the stuff that served as the decor of the Hard Rock Hotel has been sold off when the place changed hands. As he finishes this tangent, he gestures with his hands to emphasize his point. Rick says he was recently contacted by an individual who says he has all those photographs and is looking to sell them, which is a situation that Rick finds to be too good to be true, but he decides to check it out. Rick enters what looks like a well-lit office space and is welcomed by an enthusiastic man in a suit named Richard. Rick looks skeptical as he asks if Richard has the hard rock collection. Richard says that he sure does, and that they are all in the back, and he begins to lead the way deeper into the building. Rick can't believe that he managed to get all of the photos. As we arrive in the back room, the camera zooms in on all of the photographs, picturing stars from every decade of music, some of which are colorful, others in black and white, the celebrities glittering from every photograph. Rick says that it definitely is a great collection, and he says that the Hard Rock was probably considered the coolest, hippest hotel, perhaps in the world. A pop-up box informs us that the Hard Rock Hotel first opened just off the Las Vegas Strip in 1995. Rick says that the best thing about the hotel was that it had all kinds of memorabilia that simply would not have a place anywhere else, other than there or at a museum somewhere. Richard says that the photographs he bought had all once hung in the most expensive suites of the building and also in the lobbies. He had a friend who worked at the hotel who let him know that the sale was going to happen, so he made a move quickly to acquire the collection. The next informational box lets viewers know that with over 83,000 pieces, the Hard Rock has the largest music and entertainment collection in the world. Richard says that he is looking for $150,000 for the entire collection. The collection contains 50 different photographs of varying sizes. The collection is absolutely amazing, says Rick, and he focuses on a photograph of Deborah Harry, who was the lead singer of Blondie. An informational box adds that Blondie's song Rapture was the first number one song in the US to feature rap vocals. Rick is admiring all of the photographs, spending more time on Kiss in Japan. Richard confirms this and says yes, that is Kiss in Kyoto by Bob Gruen, and he adds that he is an amazing photographer, 
and that he did the famous photo of John Lennon on the streets of New York with a little hat on. Rick looks confused as he spots a picture of a young Michael Jackson playing basketball, wearing a long sleeve shirt and a Baker Boys hat. Richard validates this and says absolutely that it is an unpublished limited edition print by Neil Preston. The Hard Rock got their hands on it, and it is simply amazing he finishes. As the camera zooms in on the frame, it appears to be signed by the photographer. Rick then moves them around the room, and he asks what all this is over here. And the camera focuses in on a frame that contains multiple little pictures inside. Richard explains that this is a collage also by Neil Preston about Led Zeppelin. A box pops up and informs us that the iconic photographer Neil Preston's work has appeared in the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C. He was on tour for seven years with the band. Richard leads Rick over to the best piece of the collection. He says that this picture was taken in Wembley Stadium in London, England in 1986. It is a photograph of Freddie Mercury, his head thrown back as he gives into the passion of his music. Rick immediately recognizes him as he is a singer like no other in the world. There are a lot of photographs by Neil Preston of other legendary singers, like Bowie in 1972, Bruce Springsteen in Japan, Stevie Nicks in her dressing room. Richard says that some photographers are famous, but there are others who are legends. Rick asks how much he wants for the collection he got from the Hard Rock, and Richard tells him he wants $100,000. Rick says that he wants to get someone down here to authenticate everything. Rick leaves to make a phone call, but his expression still seems a little stunned from the high price tag he just heard. Rick looks at the camera and says he wishes he was a rock star instead of a pawn star. The expert that Rick brings in is none other than Neil Preston himself. An incredible surprise for Richard. Rick introduces him as the legend, rock and roll photographer of the ages, with a grand gesture with his arms. Neil Preston says that he has worked very closely with Queen, Led Zeppelin, Michael Jackson. The list goes on. Rick says that a lot of the photographs are his work, and he has a lot of questions. Neil says that it all looks very familiar to him, and that it all was definitely hanging at the hard rock at some point. Then Rick asks him about the famous shot of Freddie Mercury, a picture that will truly leave any person breathless to behold, and Neil gives his memory of that day. Rick notes that the photograph is 1315, so there was only 15 ever made. Neil says that they had a platinum edition made of what is now a very famous photo. Neil Preston personally signed the framed photograph and wrote out the name of the subject and date himself. Neil Preston says that he did in fact travel with Queen and that he brought him a copy of his new Queen book, a collection of photographs. The famous shot is included in the book itself, but of course much smaller. Rick is amazed with the shot and says that Freddie could not have been pulling that pose too often or he would have thrown out his back. And Neil just says that when the stars align, you nail it. The Michael Jackson pictures are then the focus, and he confirms that those are the only ones in existence as they have never been displayed anywhere but the hard rock and are one of a kind. Neil authenticates every picture. Rick calls in his art guy Chad to evaluate the value of the collection. Chad is startled by the price, but immediately sees the most expensive items in the room. He claims that the Michael Jackson one of one photographs could get up to $40,000 alone. The Queen Platinum photograph, he says, could be worth around $8,000 with no problem. Rick asks him for advice on whether he would be able to sell them all individually and make back the money. Chad points with a gloved hand at all of the magnificent pieces by the most famous photographers and says Rick will have no problem selling these. All of it together? He would even say $200,000. Rick and Richard haggle lightly and decide on $100,000. The only hard part, says Rick, is not taking all of it home and hanging it there. Subscribe to the channel if you have enjoyed the video. I will see you on the next one.